Imagine a small American town setting into the twilight of the evening, the sun casting a long shadow on clean streets, well manicured lawns and families strolling home. Yet beneath this tranquil facade lies a dark, unwritten rule that emerges at nightfall, a visible clock counting down on anyone within the city limits who isn't white. This is the life of a sundown town, a haunting relic from America's not so distant past. It still has ramifications today. And if you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemichistory.com. But without further ado, let's get started. The term sundown town refers to communities in the United States that historically practiced a form of racial segregation by systematically excluding non-whites from residing within their town after dark. These communities had rules, both written and unwritten, to keep non-white people, especially African-Americans, out of their town limits. These towns existed mainly through the 1800s through the early 1900s, but they weren't just a Southern problem. They spread all across the entire country. Within these towns, you might find signs that state, don't let the sun go down on you here, warning non-white people to leave before nightfall if they didn't. They faced threats of violence and even the possibility of being lynched. Local officials, business owners, and residents in these towns worked together to keep the communities almost entirely white. Sometimes there were actual laws that said African Americans or other minorities couldn't buy or rent homes within the area. Even when there weren't laws, white residents would often use threats of violence to enforce this racial divide. Real estate agents helped by refusing to sell or rent homes to non-white people into specific neighborhoods, a practice known as redlining. Banks also joined in by denying home loans and insurance to minorities trying to live in those areas. Police officers would enforce these rules. They would arrest or scare away any non-white resident who stayed after sundown. As it got dark, you would see more police patrols to make sure that no black person was within the city limits. But sundown towns weren't just patrolled by police. The entire community played a role in keeping the town mostly white. Anyone who tried to stand up to these rules would face economic reprisals that were as simple as being shunned by your neighbors or possibly even losing your job. In other words, everyone in these towns work together to make sure that these rules were followed, making it very hard for anyone to change them. Living in a sundown town didn't always mean that black people couldn't live there, but if they were found in these areas after dark, they faced threats, harassment, violence, even lynching. It wasn't just African Americans that were targeted. For example, in Idaho in the 1870s, Chinese people made up about one third of their population. After violent attacks against them and anti-Chinese meetings in Boise in 1886, almost none of the Chinese residents were left by 1910. In another case, in Mendine, Nevada, there was a law that forced Native Americans to leave by 6.30 at night. What started out as a whistle and later a siren would sound at 6 p.m. reminding them they had to go. This siren would even sound after Nevada passed a law in 2021 to stop such practices. But the town would claim that they were simply honoring first responders by keeping the siren. It wouldn't be until 2023 that they finally stopped using the siren. Rolling back the years to the colonial era, you will find the earliest whispers of these exclusionary practices. In 1714, the lawmakers in New Hampshire passed a law called the Act of Preventing Disorder at Night. This law stated that no Indian, Black, or mixed-race person was allowed to be away from their home after 9 p.m. Notices about this law were published in a local newspaper in 1764 and 1771 to remind everyone that it was still in effect. After the American Revolution, Virginia was the first state to ban freed black people from entering the state. According to historian Kate Master, American laws that restricted where black people could live were inspired by English laws from the Tudor period. These English laws limited the movement of poor people to make sure that local authorities would not have to take care of them. 
American officials would use these ideas to prevent the movement of black people into their communities. In 1844, the Oregon Territory, which had already banned slavery, decided to ban African Americans altogether. This law was known as the Peter Burnett Lash Law, and it said that any black person that didn't leave would be whipped, although no one was actually whipped because of this law. It was later changed to forced labor instead of whipping, and these laws continued until 1926 and showed a pattern of rules aimed at keeping minorities from living in certain areas. In other states, similar laws were passed. For example, in 1853, Illinois passed a law banning black residents. If they stayed more than 10 days and couldn't pay the fine, they would be sold at auction and forced to work to pay it off. These laws were resisted, especially by the black community, but they wouldn't be repealed until the end of the Civil War. Similar laws to this were enacted in other states like Michigan, Ohio, and Iowa. In the years following the Civil War, African Americans were promised equal rights through 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment during the Reconstruction Era. However, these promises began to crumble rapidly by 1877. Southern states swiftly enacted Jim Crow laws to enforce racial segregation and disenfranchisement. Surprisingly, this wave of racial discrimination was not simply limited to the South. Many Northern and Western states adopted similar practices that established sundown towns. These towns often used exclusionary agreements that prohibited the sale or rent of property to minorities, specifically black people. In other cases, threats, harassment, sometimes involving the police, were used to maintain the status quo. In the West, they had their own form of racial discrimination, particularly against Chinese communities. Anti-Chinese sentiment culminated in Chinese Exclusionary Act of 1882, forcing these communities out of small towns and into urban Chinatowns. This racist tide reinforced Jim Crow's legal regime in the United States and was subsequently cemented by the Supreme Court with the verdict in the Plessy versus Ferguson case. The ramifications of such racial attitudes were seen glaringly in a rise in sundown towns in the Midwest, the Appalachian, the Ozarks, and the West. Unlike the codification of segregation in the South, these towns used violence, economic coercion, and exclusionary ordinances to ensure the black residents were driven out and kept away making these areas almost exclusively white. In some extreme cases, this hostility resulted in some lynchings. In a tragic example in 1930, where two black teenagers were lynched in Marion, Indiana, which prompted the town's 200 black residents to flee for their lives, effectively making the town almost all white. Historian James Lauren, in his book, Sundown Towns, reveals that from 1890 to 1930, in 31 out of 39 states with sundown towns, the number of counties with fewer than 10 black residents increased. This paints a stark contrast with the Great Migration in which millions of African Americans flee from the South to northern industrial cities for better work opportunities and safety. While states like Illinois saw a rise in their overall black population, their rural sundown towns saw a significant decline in their black residents. During the late 19th, early 20th century, it wasn't just about physical exclusion, but also involved legal battles and economic coercion to maintain this racial segregation. In 1911, the mayor of Louisville, Kentucky, proposed a law to prohibit black individuals from owning property in specific areas within the city. Although the Supreme Court struck down this law in 1917 with the case of Buchanan Worley, cities continued to find ways to uphold segregation. Urban planners and real estate companies played a significant role in keeping white communities separate from black ones and often managing to circumvent legal restrictions. This segregation fostered racial tensions and occasionally led to violent eruptions, such as the 1943 Detroit race riot. Following World War II, the phenomenon of sundown towns evolved. Initially concentrated in small, independent rural towns, the exclusionary practices began to infiltrate suburbs and major metropolitan areas. Unlike earlier instances where towns 
with racially diverse histories became predominantly white over time, many post-war suburbs were designed from the outset to be virtually all white. The Levittown developments in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania's housed in approximately 8% of all post-war suburban residents famously excluded African Americans and Jewish people. Sundown towns also emerged in cities like Dearborn, Michigan, where in 1956, although Ford Motor Company employed 15,000 African American workers, they were not allowed to own homes within the city and had to commute from elsewhere. The dread of sundown towns made traveling long distances perilous for black people during much of the 20th century. By 1930, half of the 89 counties along the famed Route 66 from Chicago to Los Angeles lacked accommodations or restaurants for black travelers. Many strictly prohibited their presence after dark. This dangerous reality spurned Victor H. Green, a postal worker from Harlem, to create the Negro Motorist Green Book, a guide that provided information on safe accommodations for black travelers. Published annually from 1936 to 1966, the Green Book became an essential resource for almost two million black travelers at its peak, helping them navigate the treacherous landscape of a segregated society. Sundown towns would often conceal the methods they used to remain all white. They were significant barriers to safe travel for African Americans. Although laws and policies supporting racial exclusion would fade by the middle of the 20th century, the de facto sundown towns persisted almost into the 1980s, some of them even today. It underscores the necessity of the Green Book, which former NAACP President Julian Bond would describe as one of the survival tools of a segregated life. The civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s marked a transformational period for American history, culminating in legislative change. These towns flourished within a broader context of a system that resisted change. The Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, which declared school segregation unconstitutional, was a legal milestone intended to dismantle institutional racism and foster equality. However, rather than embrace integration, some towns fortify their exclusionary practices and transition into sundown towns. This trend was especially notable in places like Missouri, Tennessee, and Kentucky, where African-American populations would see drastic declines following the Supreme Court. The Fair Housing Act of 1968. This crucial act banned racial discrimination in housing and closed a dark chapter and severely limited the existence of sundown town communities despite difficulty quantifying the number due to the secretive nature of the discriminatory practices james lawn would state in his book sundown towns that there were hundreds of towns across america that were at some point sundown towns the legacy of sundown towns is profound and far-reaching these were not merely insignificant dots on the map. They were fortresses of hatred and exclusion, forever altering the lives of those caught within their shadow. Their existence choked off economic opportunities, solidifying racial hierarchies and normalized exclusion. Over time, they cemented racism into their daily lives and public policies, creating a legacy that is difficult to shake off. Interpersonal relationships with African Americans visibly unwelcome, they turned away from these towns, reinforcing stereotypes due to their limited, often distorted interactions between the races. Fast forward to today, and it's clear that those old injustices still cast long shadows. Former sundown towns might look like ordinary, but most remain overwhelmingly white. Data reveals a lack of diversity that feels like a relic from a long bygone era. So, as night falls in America, these past injustices remain as a crucial reminder that history's echoes remain, and it's up to us to take conscious, deliberate steps to erase the shadow of sundown towns. Thank you. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this has been One My Black History. So, if you can find more stories like this at onemikehistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on the Patreon page in the description below. I'd like to thank all my Patreon subscribers and my members. Without you guys, None of this could be possible. And peace.